Well, that's a little bit of what we're going to share with you about Lud's disease. Lud's disease is exactly what it is. It's heavy metal poisons that you get from water, you get from breathing it in. Once it gets in your body, heavy metals have their way of going into the nervous tissue, going uh, to your kidneys, your liver, basically everywhere in your body. Uh, but they, some of them, you know, not everything's exactly the same. The sequence of contaminated materials and heavy metals, especially the uranium suite, they're not all the same. There's different isotopes. They have a, some of them have very similar roots. They go in the body. I can explain a simple one, like uranium. Uh, when uranium is breathed in, uh, what's your hope you do and hope your body functions well and that uh, has a bit to do with your exposure and how much you breathed in, uh, what kind of detox uh, material you, you ingest to help you remove some of the things. There are a number of greens that help remove heavy metals from the body. But for the most part, uh, it comes into your lungs and when it's in small size particles, micromillimeter sizes, and that's what we call fugitive dust, the kind of thing that's difficult for your lungs to get rid of. But, hey, if you're not a smoker, uh, you haven't burned up your silly in your lungs, you, your lungs are going to do the best they can in removing this material and put it into your back into your throat. Maybe you'll cough it out, but most people uh, end up swallowing it, and it goes into your gut. Of course, you get it in your gut from other uh, ways, uh, dust on your food, materials, your hands, uh, but for the most part it's an airborne contamination pathway. And that airborne contamination uh, just gets in there and your body tries to get rid of it. Well, it gets in your gut, that's another thing. Hopefully you're going to pass it as quickly as you can before it gets absorbed. What kind of, what state it's in, what whether it's elemental, which a lot of this stuff is, and if you know anything about elements, uh, elements just don't want to remain elements. They want to connect with something. They want to bond. So they do what they do. They bond. And they bond for things that help them travel through the body or become more absorbed, absorptive. It can be absorbed better into your body. So here we are. Breathing it in in our community, not this time of the year too much because, uh, well, snow, covering it, keeping things wet, keeping the fugitive dust level down, but it's coming our way eventually. It's going to dry out, people are going to disturb it, people are going to, it's already been disturbed by all the washing and the flooding. Um, every time it happens, it resurfaces, redistributes things, puts the little stuff afloat. That's the stuff that we don't ever want to breathe. So, I'm with SafeCast, Citizen Scientist. It's a group that originated on Fukushima, and we're uploading data and information for our community. Um, here's what a typical, you know, map that we may uh, share with you. Um, I guess I could put it like this. But, uh, do another job and I'll just show you it on mine here so we can take a look at it that way. How's that? Take a look at the same map. There it is. Uh, let me see. There we go. Oh no, I guess this was a different one. This is Bonneville Community Neighborhood. Right there in the lower left corner is the Senior Citizen Center, the Employment Office. Uh, we have the Greek Church right over there. And as you can see, those little bubbles, that's just from driving in the vehicle, reading as we drive down the road. Obviously, um, depending on the sources, we're actually we're there to look at the source area up in the right-hand corner. Uh, that's one of the issues we had. That's when people wanted to have it checked, and we just happened to go wandering somewhere else. Like, hey, let's, let's go down and visit a friend, stop at the senior center. Uh, you know, so we walked down there and walked by the park, and that's the data that was collected. Obviously, there's a lot more there and a lot more concern about seabirds per hour. Uh, on the left-hand side is your graph, your color graph, 
basically, no, you don't want to camp there, you don't want to sleep there, and most of all, you don't want any of the, any of that airborne material getting into you. This was done on a snowy, wet day. This is just gamma radiation being picked up. Uh, none of the particle stuff, alpha and beta materials was, uh, let's just say, it's under the snow, as we say in Japan or elsewhere, it's keep it in the water. Yes, a lot of water if you can. So, let's take a look at what SafeCast is about, and what SafeCast does, and, well, hopefully get people involved in our community who want to stay alive and keep their children safe. So, here we go for SafeCast. You know, what is SafeCast? So SafeCast, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a long story I'll try to compress here, but basically right after the earthquake in, in March of, um, in Fukushima, mm -hmm. I have friends in Japan um, and, uh, you know, I instantly living in a place where we have big earthquakes like Los Angeles, you know, you, there's a sort of mutual camaraderie there. So I reached out to everybody I knew right away to find out, make sure everybody was safe, knew what was going on. Um, and, you know, as we were kind of talking about what was happening, it became clear that you know there was something happening with this nuclear plant and nobody could find out any information and so a handful of people who i was talking with online you know we had a little email chain at the time sort of thought well there's probably just a lot of chaos in in country at the moment mm -hmm. so we can we can go online we know how to, the internet works and stuff we can go find some of this data and maybe put it together in a in a nicer a nicer package for people so they can understand it quickly mm -hmm. um, because obviously this data has to be there right yeah, i mean yeah. A nuclear plant. Somebody's got to be paying attention to this. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that was the problem. We we went and looked, and uh, and it wasn't just that people couldn't find the information. It's that it wasn't there. There was no there was no monitoring in place of any kind. So um, once we kind of got past the shock of of realizing that there was no and this is right after the, the earthquake. Right. Yeah. Within the hit. first yeah. you know week, two weeks. Oh, right. Wow. Right. Right during this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We were looking all over, and and there was literally no systems in place to keep track of what was happening at this point. Mm. And so our initial thought was, um, we know a bunch of people. We can go get a whole bunch of Geiger counters and and just give them out to people and let people take the readings, and then we'll at least yeah. have something. And then. That became as much of a problem because the entire world supply of Geiger counters sold out in like 24 hours after that happened. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, well, there wasn't really a big market for, for Geiger counters before that, yeah. right? Nobody was paying attention. Nobody cared. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we kind of had to, had to s take a step back and figure out what we were going to do. And we had, um, we had a few devices. We didn't have nearly as many as we wanted to. And we kind of came up with this idea that rather than having one device and taking one reading with it and sort of sending in that one reading someplace, if there was a way that we could make this one device mobile, mm. collect a whole bunch of readings with it. Mm -hmm. And so we developed a system um, called, that we call the BGIGI because the, the packages sort of look like little bento boxes. Mm. We attach them to cars, they have GPS on them, wow. and we drive around and they collect a reading every five seconds as we drive. Mm -hmm. And so now with one device, rather than collecting one or two readings you know, throughout a day, you can collect 20 or 30,000 readings. So you guys went out then Right after this, went all over the you know area near the nuclear power plant. Yep, and, exactly. And just started taking readings. Started taking readings. Started making more of the devices, giving them out mm -hmm. to other people, having other people drive around, um, just collecting and publishing, which is you know so the, now, the big piece of that is is while we, while you were doing that, obviously the news agencies were you know reporting what was mm -hmm. going on and things like that. Did you find discrepancies between what the readings you guys were getting and what was being reported to the people of not only Japan but the rest of the world? Well, yes and no. I mean, one of the things that we ended up doing with this, not necessarily intentionally, was kind of changing how radiation is measured in general. Because previously, uh, they would take one reading sort of from a top of a building in the middle of a city and give an average. Uh, mm. so, so, you know, this is, this is sort of the reading for this entire city. Um, but radiation is, is much, much, much more granular than that. And so, you know, we would find very different readings just a block away from, from one another. And so our readings are ground level where people are, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of important if you're trying to figure out just what, a little what little your exposure little is. <laughs> um, and, and mapped right to a specific GPS point. So, you mm -hmm. know, we drive around kind of Google Street Map style and just cover every single thing. Mm -hmm. So if I tell you that, you know, on average, the weather in California is about 75, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily inaccurate, right. but it's not necessarily useful either, right? right? And so our data is much, much, much more specific and tells, you know, this is what's happening right outside of somebody's door. And you can actually look, uh, you know, we have Japan basically covered at this point. Yeah, I was going to ask, where can, like, you know, viewers or things like that? So you can go to safecast.org, which is our website, right? And we have, uh, we have our w uh, map on there, which has all of our data. But all of our data is completely open. Um, we publish it under what's called the CC0 license, which basically is, is as public domain as you can possibly get so anybody can take our data and do anything they want with it there's no licensing restriction of, of any kind Fantastic. so you can create your own visualizations if mm -hmm. you want to you can tap into our API you can do certain queries and just get certain kinds of data you can just download it all in one set but 
all the data, everything we have is, is out there for anybody to take and do whatever they want with. Was there anything in the, in the, in the getting of this data that, that kind of was particularly chilling? Well, so yes, at, at first, um, you know, we were the first people to publish the data that showed that the wrong areas had been evacuated. Oh, wow. Um, and and that's, that's since changed quite a bit, and you know, the, the lines of you know, where, where that is have, have adjusted appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, but the initial evacuation zones were just in perfect circles around, around the plant. There was a 20 kilometer zone and a 30 kilometer zone. Mm -hmm. um, but our data showed that there was, there was severe contamination up to 80, 90 kilometers away oh. in, in different areas. And so, um, a, as well as some areas within 20 and 30 that had no, nothing really mm -hmm. noticeable difference. So it's entirely possible that there were people who were evacuated from areas with very low contamination into areas mm. with high contamination. Oh and immediately after we published that data, mm -hmm. then the Japanese government published data which correlated with that. Okay. So they had this data and they knew it <laughs> and they didn't do anything about it oh my God. until other people published the data and then they sort of what, sort of came I mean, <laughs> I, you can't speak for the Japanese government, <laughs> I can't speak but, for the Japanese but theoretically government. what would you guess the reasons were for well, They probably didn't think anybody would know. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Do not tell, cover up. But they all do know. Uh, except in our community, the mayor himself will not let our hazmat director or the hazmat team take their Geiger counters out and collect any data to make any safeguard towards anybody in this city. Of course, their equipment is uh, upgraded and like ours, but uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an atrocity to live in a community where the government knows the agencies know, and they won't even keep a sign up to warn you. Radiation, nuclear zone, uranium zone. You can go to have your bring your kids to Tendoy School. You can go to Alameda Stake. That's all contaminated area there, and they won't tell you anything other than, oh well, maybe we should put a do not trespass sign. Idaho knows about so about trespass signs, but like a lot of people, they park right in the uranium, they trek it right into the schools, right in those kids, and every time it's disturbed and the wind blows, who do you think gets it? Your children. And Tendoy is not the only school. Oh no, Tendoy is not. Tendoy is just one that the city of Pocatello's is partially responsible for the contamination of your children and people of the north of the Alameda Stake. Every time you go there, when it's dry and the wind blows and the dust, in what direction does it blow? It blows right towards them, as well as, of course, people tracking it, picking it up in their clothes or vehicles, bringing it home, bringing it in the church, bringing it in the school. You know, hey, I hope the custodians are doing their job very well, but. Even they don't have a Geiger counter. Of course, again, the warning signs, yeah, hey, school district himself, principal himself, Tendor, will go out there and take those uranium warning signs down, which, of course, is illegal to do. But, hey, this is Pocatello, right? You voted these people in. Didn't vote for me because they know what I would do.